Stanford University. It's great to be part of the Stanford community and to, to join you all in kind of celebrating um, what's going on at Stanford. And in particular, I want to express some of the excitement and fun that we're having in this one very particular part of science that sits kind of in the middle of a couple of worlds. This is the science, cognitive neuroscience, of relating some of our most basic psychological functions, our ability to think and reason and feel and remember, and linking these to really physical things that are happening at the molecular, the cellular, the entire brain circuit level within the human brain. And we can now start to ask fascinating questions that we could never ask before. And this is a particularly exciting time for me because the kind of questions that we can ask now are not just limited to thinking about the most basic cognitive operations of the human mind, but we can start to take on new questions, such as what's going on in literacy? We can start to focus on some of these new educated and culturated skills and start to look at how are they manifested in the human brain. And when you can do that, some really remarkable things start to happen. And what I'd like to do in this talk is take you on a little tour of some of the remarkable things that can happen when you start asking this new kind of question. So I'd like to focus beyond some of these just really basic cognitive operations or mental thinking abilities to a skill, a cognitive skill that nearly everyone in this room has but didn't exist in our species 8,000 years ago because it's a culturally invented skill. It's one that's passed down from generation to generation through the act of education. And that's the skill of literacy, or forming a symbolic brain. Now, once you're so immersed in literacy, once your entire world is infused by literacy, it's kind of like the goldfish on the water. We don't really step back. with lightning fast reflexes, activate one of tens of thousands of possible specific ideas in our language. And when we take all those reflexes together into a stream of embedded, fluent, immersed literacy, we can immerse ourselves in worlds just as vividly as walking through those or talking to people or being in a social situation. In a sense, this is a form of virtual reality one of the oldest forms of virtual reality. Just by recombining these little elementary symbols, we can develop these lightning fast reflexes and then engage in new forms of immersion and reality and new forms of reasoning and new forms of sharing, both across space and across time. This is kind of a remarkable invention, but the most remarkable part of this invention is that this technology is really quite simple. Where the real amazing part of this invention came is that the people who invented this figured out that people could reorganize their brain. They could retrain their brain or rewire their brain pretty late in life to engage in this literacy behavior. So part of what we're doing now is starting to look at how does the human brain adapt to pull off this remarkable skill of literacy. And I kind of preface this as, you know, the goldfish in the water, it's kind of obvious, but I want to also contextualize this in a real world educational sense. Because, well, I'll tell you because. So I want to present to you uh, an activation map. And let me know if anybody sees a familiar pattern here of the activation in this map. This is actually not a brain activation map. This is a cultural activation map. This is a snapshot of how well the school systems across New York City are doing in terms of educating children, in terms of helping them rewire their brains to engage in the most basic proficiency things that we do in literacy and in mathematics. And what is perhaps my most frightening about this is the scale of this graph. So in the gray zones are neighborhoods, entire school districts in New York City 
that are failing more than 70% of the children in helping them guide them on the path to reorganize their brains so they can engage in one of the most exciting and transformative cultural inventions that have that ever existed. And the median of this graph are school districts that are failing 50% of the children or more. In terms of just coming over the lowest bar of basic proficiency in reading and mathematics. And so this graph serves to highlight if we could start to come together as scientists and use the powers that we have in science to start to address some of these challenges. The challenges of understanding why is it that some children struggle so profoundly with this task of rewiring their brain for this eight, six or 8,000 year old technology. And also, what is it about the learning environments that are actually helping those children the most? If we get insight into these two questions, it could be of great societal importance. So taking a brain imaging perspective or a brain systems perspective on the evolution of literacy or the development of literacy in children really allows us to connect these two very, very different worlds. On the left, we have the world of brain activity where we can start to understand what are the circuits that are crucially involved in processing symbols in the visual world and what are the circuits that are crucially involved in processing auditory sounds in the linguistic world and how it is that these are mapped together and change as children learn. And on the right, we have the education world. What is it about these learning environments and these amazing, gifted, talented teachers that are guiding the children through this journey of rewiring their brains to engage in this brand new culturally invented skill? And we can start to look at the interaction between these and kind of refocus what is one of the most exciting questions in neuroscience. And that is the question of how is it that our subjective mental experiences change the physical activation in the human brain? This question of experience-dependent plasticity. And now we can start to ask that question, not just at the most basic level of what happens if you put a kitten in a pirate costume during the first three days of life and how do they reorganize their visual system, but at a much higher level. What is it about these transformative learning experiences that are helping children to rewire brain systems to support these new abilities? And that's what I want to talk about today. One thing that's allowed us to do this, we couldn't do this before, is the invention of fMRI and some pioneers in the field who have really gone to great lengths to figure out one of the most challenging things you could do in science, which is to get a six-year-old child to lay still <laughs> inside <laughs> of an fMRI scanner so that they can activate the brain as they do reading type tasks and examine what's going on. And part of the invention of this was uh, the use of simulation techniques where you, in a really playful environment, introduce the child to all of the things that they need to know. This is my uh, colleague, Kim Noble, helping one of our um, participants in a simulator. All right, so you can lean back. So remember, what's the most important thing about getting your brain picture taken? Stay still. That's right, I want you to be still like a statue. So it becomes kind of a fun game for them, and we actually have uh, a lot of in innovations that have made this a really kind of fun, engaging experience for the children. So for instance, when the child goes into an MRI, they have a little video monitor, which is, has closed caption TV to the experimenter that they just built up rapport with, making faces at them, playing games with them, encouraging them to stay still. They can also play little video games in there that allow us to activate the brain in different ways and explore how their circuitry is organized. And Some of the things, just to give you a preview of the talk, that come to the forefront of this kind of investigation, I want to really dive into three different ways in which I think this is really informative and ways in which this is kind of exciting and taking us in new directions. So one idea is that in the skilled reading adult, we can use fMRI to really figure out what are the brain mechanisms of expertise? Once you've built the clock, how does the clock work? What brain mechanisms are really crucial for reading? And how have they come to be? The second question is this notion of moving beyond the study of the human brain. Instead of trying to come up with general laws of 
looking at brain activity and how they're related to experiences, we can start to look at how individuals, individual brains differ one from another. And we can just go beyond quantifying how brains differ one from the other and start to look at differences that actually matter to the process of developing literacy, of rewiring the brain to engage in this skill. And then the third, I think, most exciting question are collaborations between educators and cognitive neuroscientists to start to get at this question about what are the forces of education? What is it that a skilled educator can really do to help drive change within the minds and brains of these children? And how, what, what are the sort of key aspects of learning experiences that make the change really um, occur? So let me just start off with a couple of brief introductory notes about what, some of the things that we've learned about the brain circuitry of reading. So um, just to give you a cartoon framework of some of the, there's lots of things going on when somebody learns to read. There are incredible uh, network changes at multiple levels and at many levels of description. But one really crucial aspect of learning to read is the notion that there are specialized circuits in the brain that are involved in seeing the visual world seeing symbols in the visual world, like these regions in the back of the left hemisphere of the brain. There are also areas of the brain that are crucial for processing auditory language, for just hearing words and thinking about what they sound like. And the challenge for the brain in learning to read is that the brain has been fully adapted over the course of five or six years to the linguistic world and to the visual world. And it has these great systems built up to do everything that it needs to do. But now culture has kind of thrown them a loop. Now you have to reorganize pretty late in life. You're six years old, and we're asking the children, would you please reorganize these systems in a way that's never been uh, connected before to form novel connections between these visual regions and these auditory language regions, which are now going to become so fast that in one fifth of a second, I can give you any of 50,000 visual words, and you're going to know exactly, with a lightning flex, fast reflex, what word I'm talking about in the linguistic world. And you're going to be able to chain those reflexes together to immerse yourself in literacy. This is a big challenge for the brain. And one of the, re one of the reasons why we're studying this is that we want to get at the heart of a very deep question. Why is it so difficult for some children to reorganize their brain for fluent literacy and others just take to it like a fish to water. Is there something that we can, can we move beyond descriptions to say, yes, we see that some children do this really quickly and some children struggle profoundly and start to move towards explanations and insights into these individual differences? So one of the big questions and one of the big, I think, most useful and exciting parts of this kind of science is that we can move beyond a central model of the brain, and we can start to look at individual differences. We all know that there's large individual differences between individuals in terms of a whole host of skills that they might have. These are examples of some of the most successful human minds and contributors, contributors to our culture. And I wonder if anybody sees one thing that might be in common across all of these illustrative individuals who have contributed so much, other than perhaps being really wealthy or being really, really famous. That's right. So each of these individuals has publicly announced that they struggle profoundly with the process of learning to read. And we can start to understand that when somebody struggles with learning to read, it doesn't necessarily reflect a lack of an abundance of talent in all kinds of domains but it might really reflect a challenge that they have in one or two or three particular components that might not relate to their intelligence, might not relate to how gifted they are or what they could contribute. So we're very interested in figuring out what are those, a couple, those small component skills that they might struggle with most profoundly that can actually explain this individual difference. And can we figure out the brain mechanism behind it? So, some of the work that we've been doing has actually been pretty exciting about this because we can now take children in the first years of elementary school who, are, who have different degrees of struggling with reading 
and we can start to look at the brain circuits that are crucial for learning and how they're related to different skills, different component skills they have. So this is a brain scan, this is a, a composite brain scan of many, many children that we brought together that had differences in their reading ability. And this graph is showing you two things. One, the network in the brain which is most active when these children are reading. Note that it contains activation in this visual region, which is really important for looking at symbols. And it also contains activation in this left hemisphere region, which is crucial for processing language. This graph is also showing us something really important, that not all children activate this brain circuit the same way. And we can figure out which children are activating it really well and which children are struggling with it and correlate that with other skills that they have. This graph demonstrates a correlation between how active this brain circuit is when they're reading and the child's skill at a task that we call phonology or thinking about the sounds of language. If you listen to words and reflect on the structure of the sounds within those words, this is something we don't typically do when we listen to language. We're typically listening to language because we want to know what the words mean. But you can listen to language in a completely different way. You can focus on the little sounds that build up all of the words. And when you focus your mind on this, you are activating a process that we call phonological awareness or phonological processing. And children differ tremendously in this skill. Children who struggle at this skill when they're in a brain scan doing a reading task show less activation in this brain circuit. Children who thrive at this skill, who do really, really well at playing with the sounds within words or focusing their mind on them, they activate this region when they're reading really robustly. And a whole wealth of research on children's literacy development has suggested that this ability to focus your mind on language and the sounds within words is a crucial precursor skill for building up literacy. Here, we're seeing that it really makes a big difference in terms of how different the brain is active. I want to talk about another form of brain imaging, shift gears a little bit, because it allows us to ask the same sets of questions, but in a really different way. So in, in these experiments, we can surround the head with 128 sensors that sense the brain's fluctuations in energy over time. And we can take 1,000 pictures a second as a child reads a word. And we can do this over and over and over again to produce a profile of how does this brain's response change when they're looking at a word that they know versus a word that they've never seen before or some other control uh, stimulus. This allows us to do something, what I think is really incredible and something that we haven't been able to do for a long time, which is something akin to stop motion photography. This is a picture of a water drop shortly after a water's been dropped and hit the surface of the water and disturbs the water. And if you stop it at one particular point, you can see some really amazing dynamics. You can see that this drop of water here, this is not the original drop of water. This is an echo drop, which is leaping up out of the water and hovering for a little bit of time and then dropping back down into the water. And this stop motion photography has caught this dynamic process at this really interesting moment. And we can do that with electrophysiology. We can look at when a word hits the retina, kind of like the drop of water, and it resonates through the visual and phonological circuits, we can stop the animation one-fifth of a second after a child looks at a word and look at the patterns of activation when a child is a skilled reader and they know the word versus something that they've never seen before. And if you look over the back of the head, you can do a voltage topography. And this, in a sense, is amazing that we can do this even with skilled adult readers. That if the symbol that they were looking at a fifth of a second ago is an English word, we see this strong left hemisphere activity. And if the symbol that they were looking at is something that they've never seen before, an unfamiliar word in an unfamiliar script, we see the, the brain show a novelty response in a sense, of this right hemisphere activation.
This is happening just one fifth of a second after they look at a symbol, which is either the object of their expertise or a novel stimulus, and gives us some insight in terms of how it is that the brain is retuning our perceptual processes or these lightning fast literacy reflexes as a result of our, of our education. You can do this with familiar and unfamiliar languages and show the contrast and really drive this connection between the experiences that these individuals have had in learning to read in their culture and the impact that it's had on brain mechanisms. Now this alone is great. It puts us in the realm of looking at experience and expertise changing brain circuitry. But what's really even better is that we can now look at how this plays out differently in individual children. With this technology, you can do this with children of all ages. And just as there's huge individual differences in terms of what children do when you say smile and point a camera at them, I don't know what, what this guy's doing. He's not <laughs> cooperating so well. <laughs> there's also large individual differences in terms of how children respond when they're reading words. Some children are showing lightning flat, fast reflexes just like the expert. Other children are not quite showing that quite yet. It's yet to be developed. Some of our research is exploring how individual differences in this expertise rewiring of the brain's response to visual words is related to children's emerging literacy skills. And we see really strong relationships that are not just explained by age or not just explained by what grade they're in, but really the degree to which we show this expertise pattern is strongly related to how well children are doing on tests that are very much like what the educational systems are doing for seeing who's doing really well on this side of the graph and who's really doing poorly. And this is a graph of the degree to which they're left lateralized. Another thing that this very, very different look at individual differences can tell us is something that we couldn't really do before. We can use the neural signals that children are generating to actually drive predictions of how this process of putting literacy together in the brain, rewiring the brain for reading, is going to likely play out, all else being equal. So I want to share with you a study uh, led by Urs Maurer, who was a postdoc that worked with me, went back to, the, back to Switzerland to carry out this study, and demonstrated something really remarkable. He took measurements of children before they learned to read and looked at how does their brain respond when there's a subtle change in the language. So if they're listening to a stream of language sounds and there's a little change, to what degree does the brain respond when there's a little change? So if they listen to da, 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 ta, da, 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 ta, there's little changes in the stream. And we can look at how does the brain activate when there's a little change. And what he found were large individual differences in children. About half a second after the change, some children showed this strong left hemisphere pattern. And other children showed a strong right hemisphere pattern. And children ranged all, all the range between right hemisphere and left hemisphere and bilateral patterns. Most all the children showed some response to the change. But the children who showed this strong left hemisphere pattern in kindergarten went on two or three or four years later to develop literacy skills that were much better than the children who showed this bilateral or right lateralized pattern. So he was able to, in a sense, show a powerful prediction into the future relating on the x-axis how left lateralized was their response when you change the sound in language versus how right lateralized it was. And a strong relationship with the y-axis, which is how many correct words could they read per minute? How fluently were they engaging in reading text out loud? And this is a remarkable relationship because this is something that happens just in the fifth of a second when the brain's listening to a change in language in kindergarten. And this measure was collected several years later when the child has spent a couple of years trying to rewire their brain for literacy, suggesting that there's a potential profound relationship in which we could use these brain signals to actually predict who's likely headed for risk and who's likely 
headed for success and allow us to potentially work with that actionable knowledge that we could use to help a child, give them just the resources they need just at the time they need it. <laughs> you can push this even farther. There is an amazing research going on uh, at the Uvascular Longitudinal Study in Finland looking at babies who are born to parents who are dyslexic, who are at risk for themselves becoming dyslexic. And you can look at their brain responses to sounds in their language and show that the children who have an at-risk parent or a dyslexic parent show a different brain response than the babies who are born to parents who have no family history of dyslexia. And these signals in the infant brain are actually related eight years later to which of these babies in the at-risk group are going to develop dyslexia and which are not. So there's exciting questions that you can ask with this technology, with this combination of neuroscience and education that we couldn't ask before. And it's giving us new insights into reading, reading development. But I'd like to move beyond individual differences to think about another issue. And this is, I think, where the rubber really hits the road, where the connection between neuroscience and education becomes the most exciting. And that is understanding the mechanisms of change. What are the psychological and neural mechanisms of change that occur that allow us to build these literacy circuits, that allow us to rewire the brain for reading? And I want to have a little fun with you guys to give you a sense of where this research is going and how we're uh, tackling some of these problems. So one of the first things that we need to do is to understand what are some of the most powerful tools that we have right now that we can use as educators, as psychologists, to modulate the brain, to activate the brain. And one of the most exciting discoveries for me in neuroscience, thinking about the connection between psychology and brain activity, is this notion of selective attention. So one big idea that I'd like to propose is that selective attention, this willful, volitional, goal-directed ability that we have to attend to some things and ignore others, to attend to my kind of droning, southern Michigan accented voice over time versus focusing on your own thoughts that are sometimes popping up and intruding. This ability to selectively attend has a powerful impact on brain activity. <coughs> Selective attention acts as a neural modulator. It acts as a gain control. If you guys sit for a second and just follow my voice and slowly breathe in and breathe out and focus your mind on your nose, on your nostrils, and the difference in sensation when you inhale versus exhale. You've been inhaling and exhaling, I hope, the entire time that we've been together. <laughs> but right now, on purpose, volitionally, you're focusing your selective attention on one part of the map in your brain of your body. And when you do this, you're increasing the brain activity in this particular circuit that represents your nostrils and your nose, and you're increasing the gain control on signals there, and you're increasing your ability to make discriminations between the inhaling signal and the exhaling signal. And this is all just driven by selective attention. There's no change in the stimulus. You are always inhaling and exhaling. The difference is tuning your mind into that particular information and activating that brain circuit on purpose. I think this is a powerful tool that we have in psychology. I think it's a powerful tool that we have in learning and a powerful tool that really skilled educators have mastered. They've helped children focus their minds in very particular ways. And in doing so, they may also be changing the way they're activating their brain. So I want to make a connection here between this notion of selective attention. It's a novel connection. Most people have never heard about it unless they read the particular studies that we've published over the last five years. But I want to focus your mind on selectively attending to the sounds within your language. This is something we don't typically do. We do it when we're rhyming or detecting bad poetry or other things. Um, but I want you to just get the feeling of what it's like to, on purpose, selectively focus your attention on the sounds within our language and ignore 
something else, like the chimes of a cell phone going off or something like this. So I'm going to play for you two sounds. And I want you to focus your mind first on the chimes, the, the cell phone chimes that are buried within these stimuli. Phase. Noise. Were those the same cell phone chimes or two different cell phone chimes? OK, now focus your mind instead, on purpose, on a very different way of listening to language. I want you to listen to these two words, or these two sounds, these two complex sounds, and focus your mind on the sound structure of the words. And tell me whether the words rhyme or not. Bays. Noise. OK, most great. You passed the test. <laughs> Bays and noise do not rhyme, at least by my definition of rhyming. I hope yours. Now here's the question. Could we, in a neuroimaging experiment, look at the difference in brain activity when you're focusing your mind on one type of difficult auditory stimulus and making a decision versus another type of difficult auditory dis decision? Can we look at the brain activity of change that occurs when you focus your mind on the sound structure of language? And if we could do that, what would that circuit look like? And what might it have to do with this challenge that children are having in reorganizing their brain for reading. And the results of this kind of blew us away. We couldn't really believe this. And we actually went up, wound up replicating the experiment and analyzing it multiple times. But the question is, does directing a listener's attention to phonology impact the brain circuitry of reading? And what we found, if you do the very experiment that I did with you over and over and over again inside of a loud, noisy fMRI scanner, and we focus people to listen to the same exact stimuli and try to focus their mind on the sound structure of the auditory words or focus their minds on the music, we found that we activated this strongly left lateralized left hemisphere brain circuit that was coextensive with the reading network. We saw these left frontal, these left medial temporal and superior temporal regions. And we also saw, remarkably, even though there is no visual stimuli in this experiment, that the act of focusing your mind when you're a skilled reader on the sounds of words and judging whether they rhyme lead to an activation of the very same visual regions that are active when we look at visual words. There's a kind of reentrant processing going on. So as a skilled reader, you have connected your language circuitry to your visual circuitry so robustly that just by presenting you auditory words and asking you to engage and focus your mind on the phonology of words, we're activating the visual forms in our, in our uh, reading circuitry. And this, in a sense, was remarkable to us and started to change the way we started thinking about brain activity and experiences of reading and how it's reshaping the brain. We had kind of a shift in our focus and what we've been doing with this from before, thinking about experience-dependent plasticity is almost like a bottom-up thing. You have these experiences. You look at these words. You get thousands of hours of experience looking at these stimuli. And the brain is reshaped by those stimuli hitting the brain. And we started to shift towards thinking more about a top-down effect that, by on purpose, directing your attention to the sounds of language and the connections that they have with the visual symbols, in this very particular way, this may be driving changes in this brain circuitry and may be important for setting this circuitry up in the first place. So we started to move beyond this, ex this kind of experiment to start to see whether this could have an impact on how the brain rewires for novel learning experiences. And we started to ask the question about pedagogical effects of attending to phonology in words. So, does the way a teacher directs a learner's attention, does that impact the brain circuitry of reading? Does that change how having a learning experience for learning to read a novel word, does it change the brain circuitry which is recruited by that novel learning experience? So to do this, we kind of we started off small in the laboratory, highly controlled environments, with artificial stimuli that we had some fun making up. We presented folks with stimuli under different cover stories. You might try in this experiment to learn a couple dozen of these little characters and what words they are. 
And under one condition, you may be told that these are abstract symbols that represent the idea of a word, like cat. And in another condition, you might be told, this is actually a writing system, and it has a couple of letters. It makes words at the top and the middle and the bottom. And when you try to learn these, you can focus your mind on the sound structure of the words that we're trying to teach you and link it up to the symbols. So then we can simply ask, under really nicely controlled uh, situations, what's the difference between trying to learn a couple dozen of these when the teacher is focusing your mind in this way versus what's changing in the brain and the mind when the teacher is focusing you on learning this way? And the remarkable thing about doing a lab experiment study is we can hold everything else constant. We can have the learner's constant, the teacher's constant, we can have the stimuli constant, the difficulty of these tasks are relatively equated, and then we can ask a really fun question. What happens the day after you learn this novel stimulus? Does it matter how the teacher introduced the task to you? And the answer seems to be yes. So this is a voltage topography about a one-fifth of a second after the stimulus hits the eye, after they've learned this task, they've learned to read these words. And the folks who are under the grapheme phoneme focused condition show this strong left hemisphere pattern, which bears a remarkable similarity to the expert pattern that we see in the expert reader. And the folks who learned this whole word association, they learned it successfully, but because they were introduced to it in a different way, because the teacher focused their mind and their volition and their top-down learning mechanisms in a different way, they wound up with a very different pattern, which was much stronger on the right and much more characteristics of what we see for a novel character that people have never seen before. So I think I have about five minutes left. Is that right? We've got 20? OK, well, 15 for questions. But let me just in the last section of the talk, tell you why it is that these laboratory experiments are so important to me. I think sometimes in discussions about laboratory experiments, people come away with the question of like, why on earth are they spending so much time on this particular question? And the reason why is I think this is a foundational question for establishing literacy in the human brain. And I think that this question of how is it that we focus the, the learner's attention during learning and how, in particular, we focus the mind on phonology during reading experiences and experience in learning to read is that this may have impact at a broad scale. So outside the laboratory, hopefully what we discover within the laboratory under these controlled situations are going to generalize in a really powerful way to the broad issues that we start off with, the broad societal issues that there are thousands and thousands of children who are struggling with this task, and thousands of school districts that are failing broad swaths of the population to carry off this basic rewiring for literacy. And we can start to move beyond the laboratory and do collaborations with educational psychologists, with field study experts, with tutors that are working with these children, and asking them to try two different things with the children and compare what happens. So I want to just briefly, in the last few minutes that I have, talk about the promise of and potential hazards of uh, computer-aided instruction. There's this notion that we've had early on in this process and that cognitive scientists have been enamored with, that if we could get some of these pedagogical techniques embedded into educational software, that it could have profound scaling up effects and helping children in education. And we're a couple of decades into this process now of trying to infuse pedagogy into computer software, have children interact with it, and show tremendous educational benefits. The real world news is that the dream isn't quite coming true yet. Um, in a recent meta-analysis, which has looked at individualized computer-assisted instruction for children, has shown only marginal impacts. So something on the accord of like one-tenth of a standard deviation. For children, not a very small sample size. 11,000 children represented across these 19 studies. And 
the impact seems to be quite marginal as a whole. There's variation. Sometimes it's working well and sometimes it's working poorly, but we have to move beyond this class of thinking, oh, we'll use computer-aided instruction to address the, ch the challenges of these children. And we start to need to really dig into the psychology and the pedagogy, which is most impactful. The other sad news is that in this meta-analysis, it didn't seem that the impact of these things was related to the duration. It wasn't the fact that if you just ran them longer, you've got even bigger effects systematically across this meta-analysis. But in a sense, one of the hopes is that education, the, one of the findings of this study that showed one of the largest effects is that educational technology that incorporates interaction outside the program. So when the computer program is actually connected to what the children are doing in a human social context, this seems to have larger effects, significantly larger effects. So I think that the real challenge for the collaboration of cognitive science, neuroscience, and education especially as it's related to this computer technology question, is how can we collaborate to make these learning experiences even more powerful? This meta-analysis is underscored by some more bad news, which is coming out of the, the PISA studies and the OECD, suggesting that the more schools tend to engage in this computer-aided instruction, the more prevalent it is on these scales of prevalence, the worst children are doing on their standardized scores. And the sweet spot seems to be that this right around, there, there seems to be an early ramp of effect that um, uh, no technology at all isn't doing such a great benefit and there's some benefit of introducing technology, but more is not necessarily better. We have this curvilinear relationship which is peaking below the mean. And this is true both for uh, reading digital print on screens as well as uh, reading actual print on physical paper. So in a sense, caveat emptor, we shouldn't necessarily be enamored with the prospects of technology to address these questions. But I still think that technology opens up this amazing possibility of taking these powerful ideas from cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience and actually embedding them directly within the software. And taking advantage of what we've learned, instead of having children in isolation with a computer, put them together with a well-meaning tutor and see whether the software can turbocharge that student-tutor interaction, putting tutors and students and computers together, in a sense, to see if we can drive some of these effects. And so I want to leave you with just the, a brief highlight of some research that we've carried out, combining naive tutors and intelligent computers, working with children in New York City public schools who are struggling with reading, and using some of the same techniques that we talked about, but in collaboration with highly skilled educational psychologists and practitioners to take the challenge of how do you drive a child's mind to think about the sound structure of words as their reading words. And there are ways of embedding this software with powerful pedagogical techniques that drive a child's attention to the sound and letters that construct all of these words and guide them through the process of building letters into words and building words into sentences and building sentences into discursive interactions with the tutor. We can contrast the impact of this kind of computer uh, technology paired with tutors with control conditions, and we started off with a pilot study that showed that there was a large significant effect with a much larger effect size than we're seeing typically in the field for when children are using this kind of word building intervention versus a waiting list control condition. But we can move beyond that and replicate that actually in New York City public schools to see with much larger sample sizes of 60 children what the impact of randomizing the tutor to using this computer-aided software that guides the child's attention to the sounds of words and link them up with the letters in this highly adaptive, interactive way versus what's typically done in New York City public schools, which is a, a guided reading process with a tutor in which they try to get children excited about books and help them uh, read the words for them that they struggle with and things like this. And there was a significant effect even in this 
highly controlled uh, field study, which allows us to see what the impact of this idea is. And even some pilot research suggesting that when children engage in this software, the regions of the brain that are changing the most are the very regions that we're trying to engage when focusing the mind on phonology. So this is just meant to be a, a toy example, if you will, of what can happen when these fields come together and start to collaborate and start to take on some of these challenges that are posed by individual differences in early reading, some of these insights that we have from psychology of what are the mechanisms that might drive these changes in brain activity and use this to sort of construct a problem for a well circumscribed construct a, a way to address this well-circumscribed problem of the child who's having trouble decoding words. This software, once, it's, once the genie's out of the bottle, can be readily copied by anybody in the world. And I have colleagues in the Netherlands who have uh, taken this, this same general structure and have created kind of a mirror copy of this and used it in studies to look at children who are struggling to um, master the Dutch language and Dutch reading. Placing this in a larger context, though, I think we have to come to grips with the fact that in pedagogy, there may not be sort of one dominant way which is going to win out. And by putting these different approaches to learning to read or the launching children into the goal of literacy, which is this immersive experience of virtual reality supported by text, that there may not be one size, a one-size-fits-all solution. Um, there's some powerfully compelling research coming out now looking at individual differences that suggest that if you place some children in a teacher-directed, highly structured alphabetic program, they will do really quite well. And if you take those same children and place them in a child-directed, implicit focus that's focusing more on reading entire words and passages that they do quite poorly. But other children who don't have these particular weaknesses or these particular needs may do much better in a child-directed, uh, more exploratory, implicit uh, training environment. So it might be the case that we really need to customize the pedagogy to the insights that we have about the individuals as learners. So I want to wrap up by just suggesting to you that there's kind of a new game happening in science. It's highly collaborative. It's bringing together scholars that might not have talked to each other before in exciting ways. Bringing together people who are experts in questions and challenges and methods that are effective in education. And researchers who are looking at changes in brain development and changes in brain activity and individual differences that we can measure at the neuronal level. And collaborations across these individuals are helping us to do things that we could never do before. We can start to look at before and after brain images with in between an educational experience that a child has with a particular piece of software, with a particular pedagogical technique. And we can start to draw causal relationships between the changes that we see in the brain activity before and after and the educational experiences which drive that change. And I think this is the birth of a new area in science that we like to call educational neuroscience. And I'd also like to stress that these are the early years, which in some sense are, are, is the place where we have the most fun. So thank you very much for your attention. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.